Hi, my name is Chris Reed. I'm a creative coder and data scientist who happens to enjoy all things creative. As part of this discovery, I've wanted to start documenting artists that use technology to inform and generate the works as part of their process. I've decided to use long form conversation as a means to document the conversations. And this probably means that we're going to have a little bumpy ride together starting out um, because I'm going to be experimenting with this form. But what I hope to bring out in the end with each one of these conversations is uh, the ability to celebrate the works of the artists, understand their perspectives, and help inspire others by leaving a little trail of interesting insight in the world. I'm honored to share this conversation with Tyler Hobbs and hope to find it inspiring and helpful. Tyler is a generative artist from Austin, Texas. For each work, Tyler writes a custom computer programming specifically designed to generate a series of abstract images. His work focuses on the interplay of randomness and order and draws inspiration from paint, vegetation, and natural occurring patterns. It was a great conversation we were able to have. And as you hear, you will see that uh, it is a work in progress for me. And I hope that that will not deter from the nuggets of truth and perspective that Tyler was able to provide us um, in the conversation that we had. So presenting Tyler Hobbs. Tell me who, who like inspired you right at the very beginning. I've never been super inspired by a lot of other existing generative artists. As I dug in, I eventually found some, but I'm really a lot more of my inspiration came from a couple of sources. One of them was um, traditional painters, a lot of abstract painters, especially abstract expressionists, um, you know, Jackson Pollock, Mark Rothko, all those sorts of names. Um, I was I, I was and, and still really enjoy their work a lot, and it definitely is a big influence on me. Um, and uh, early on, I took a lot of inspiration from the natural world as well. I did a lot of uh, studies of things like uh, grasses and textures and uh, watercolor paint, where really I was trying to like model these real world processes and environments through programming. Um, and uh, that was just really inspirational for me as well. Um, so I would say that those were kind of my big early uh, drivers in terms of what I was interested in artistically. Yeah, yeah. No, that's interesting. Um, so t tell me a little bit from an for the users really is just abstract art in general. What is kind of like your definition of abstract art and um, how do you think that abstract and the generative really like align to each other or are they like diabolical? <laughs> Not diabolical, but <laughs> diametrically opposed. One another. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so that's a, that's a great question and it's not a simple answer. Um, if you took a look at, at something like abstract painting, there's a lot of core design ideas that, that transfer over, right? Like if we're talking at a really basic level, a lot of the same things about colors and color combinations apply and, and uh, negative space and rhythm and, and all those sorts of things you learn about in like high school art class, right? Like the same concepts apply from abstract painting to, to generative artwork, really the biggest difference I think in generative artwork is since you're dealing with, you're not trying to just create a single image for the most part, you're trying to create an entire process or an entire system to generate a, a series of images. At least I think that's one of the coolest aspects of generative art. And that's the mindset that really sets it apart from abstract art, uh, 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 painting I mean is that you're not pursuing a single uh, image, you're pursuing this entire system. And that makes you think about the way that the pieces are really related and the way they're really structured uh, at a higher level 
than when you're just trying to create one instance of it. Um, so all those skills that you learn from painting are very useful in generative art, but it kind of goes another level. Yeah. Yeah, no. It's, it's what I've found thus far. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so when it goes back to your more traditional like painting, um, how do you think that influences your current and your, uh, I guess, future work? Or how do you th at least see that influence it? Yeah, um, also a great question. I mean, I think um, some of the things that I carry over from, from you know, my painting background and my love of, of painting, one of them is I think uh, kind of the messiness of painting Right, so like a lot of digital artwork is has this very like clean, cold um, aesthetic to it, and that's kind of what the computer makes by default. Uh, yeah. Whereas uh, paintings, right, you look at them up close, they're messy. They have all these little imperfections. Um, you see the texture of the brush or the canvas, um, and um, I've always really liked that messiness. And so I try to bring some of those same elements of imperfection, of, of warmth, of texture into my generative artwork. Um, that's played a really big role. Um, I think a lot of my my color palette, um, just the colors that I enjoy, I think those have kind of soaked in from the paintings that I enjoy. Um, I think that's carried over. Um, but I also don't just wanna try to stick to what painting can do, right? Like I have these tools that uh, expose a whole different set of abilities and I'm really interested also and exploring the ways that computers can allow us to move beyond traditional painting. So things like um, uh, just working with um, extreme precision, right? Uh, computers can be very precise. If I work with the, the plotter, that can be very precise even in a physical format. Um, things like uh, just, uh, you can work with millions of, of points or lines in one image, things that would be uh, at the very least, incredibly difficult to execute by hand. Um, uh, there's just a whole different field of work that you can create generatively. And so uh, part of what I try to do with my work also is to move beyond, to move in those areas that um, are kind of special to the medium. Um, and I think that's where it gets set apart from something like painting. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. So let's dive into a little bit more the uh, the technical process that you take. Sure. What languages, frameworks that are you using and um, yeah. how much input do you have from the physical world and yeah. how much is programming? Sure, sure. Um, so uh, kind of at a core level, I work with um, a, a, a sort of library or platform called Processing, um, which is very popular for generative artists. Um, uh, I'd say the main difference uh, in my setup is that I, I access it through a programming language called Clojure, which is a Lisp uh, dialect that runs on the JVM, the Java Virtual Machine. And so its processing is Java-based. Um, essentially, I can have access to all of the processing tools uh, through Clojure, and um, as well as the rest of the Java ecosystem, which is really powerful. But uh, since it's a Lisp language, uh, it's really powerful. It's really expressive. I'm able to do a lot with uh, just a little bit of code, and I think it's uh, an excellent fit for generative artwork. Um, so that's kind of the core of, of my stack. Um, uh, remind me of what the, the rest of your question was. <laughs> um, basically, your inputs. Um, but, yeah, were right. you... yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, in terms of uh, inputs to the program, so for the most part, uh, my work is kind of a no input program, right? It's, the program runs and it generates output and that's uh, the final output. And there's no data, I'm not doing like data visualization, I'm not doing image processing. Um, and that's, that's mostly how I work and that's especially how I started out. But in the past, few years, I've gotten more and more into trying to involve uh, drawing by hand into the process. Uh, and I've experimented with doing that a lot of different ways. But 
Um, maybe the simplest example of that is just, let's say I draw uh, a curve on a Wacom tablet and I capture that curve as, as, as data, right? A series of points. I can then feed that as input into one of my algorithms and kind of use it as a starting point. Um, and that can come in really handy. Um, there's a lot of things that are really natural to do by hand and are really unnatural to do by programming and vice versa, right? And so, um, like, let's say I just want to draw like a, a quick outline of a face, right? Like really easy to do by hand, totally impossible to do purely through programming. And so, um, uh, I think there's a really cool space in the middle where you take elements of both and, and allow them to work together. And so that's really been a big area of, of investigation for me and absolutely one that um, I'm going to continue to investigate in the future. Yeah, it definitely shows, especially your most like recent works. You definitely have this ability. And this goes back to your point earlier is bringing in quote unquote chaos to the system or just like randomness that isn't just, you know, Perlin noise or anything of that nature. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So just for the readers or the listeners, um, yeah. Lisp versus Java or sure. Lisp-based closure versus Java. What's the difference? Sure. Um, so Java at a high level, like Java is this very highly structured, um, very picky, very verbose language, right? Like it's great for you've, you know, your IBM and you have a thousand programmers working on one, uh, program and they need to all write code that all works together in one single style. It's great for that. Um, uh, closure is like the other end of the spectrum. It's like, um, uh, super expressive. You can almost kind of change the programming language itself through things like macros. Um, it's, you know, it's dynamic, it's evaluated, you can uh, uh, evaluate it at runtime really easily. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of higher level language features. Um, so these are all really uh, cool tools that allow you to express a lot with a, with a very small amount of code. However, there's not uh, as much rules and regulation, right? So everybody who writes Clojure, they might end up writing it kind of a different way and it'd be a lot more difficult to organize a team of a thousand programmers, <clears throat> I think, to write uh, closure together. But I'm one artist working alone. Um, I don't really care if anybody else can even understand yep. my code. I don't even have to maintain my own code. Like uh, I write the program and it's done. So yep. um, uh, those issues don't matter at all. So I basically I get all the upsides of closure and, and the downsides don't matter. Um, yep. And uh, so yeah, I would say you know it's Lisp is a pretty different programming language from from Java or anything that's kind of in the C family of programming languages. But for anybody who's really trying to become a better programmer, I, I highly recommend um, learning a language like Clojure at some point. Yeah, yeah. So being that we talked a little bit about general art and that being a system of quote unquote um, equations in a sense. But yeah, the system in which randomness has been introduced to create some sort of artwork. Do you mm -hmm. think that there's anything different between like generative art and creative coding? Um, I think that, um, yeah, I mean, uh, at the surface level, it's a just a subcategory of creative coding in some ways. Um, well, let me take that back. So generative art doesn't even have to involve programming. Um, there are artists like um, Saul Lewitt who wrote, who, who created artwork through writing a series of instructions that are to be executed by a human rather than a programmer, or sorry, rather than a computer. Um, so they, they might say instructions like, um, you know, take a wall and, uh, Fill it with vertical lines, and then uh, you know, draw curvy horizontal lines across the entire wall. Like they're very open-ended instructions that are, there's, they're open to a lot of interpretation uh, when being executed. But they're they're generative in the sense that um, the piece of artwork is the instructions for creating the artwork rather than the final product. And there's not this firm 
grasp on exactly what the final product must be. Um, so generative artwork can be uh, created that way. Generative artwork can be created through um, things like you know the Dada uh, art movement back in the 20s. They did things like uh, rolling dice to decide what color to you know to choose, or they would drop you know confetti that would land on the canvas, and they would paint whatever wherever it landed. So there's a lot of ways you can create generative art without um, programming. And so in that sense, generative art is not just a subset of creative coding. However, I'll say that the easiest and probably the most interesting way to create generative art is through programming. And, and you know, that's definitely the popular way to create it today. Um, it's, uh, you know, creative coding can encompass a lot of things. I think generative art uh, is one of the branches that has the most potential for kind of deep and serious work, but um, I probably shouldn't make such a sweeping statement. I can't think of everything that might be encompassed in creative coding right now. But, <laughs> um, yeah. Well, my thought was, um, you know, creative coding has a lot of mediums, you know, when it comes to yeah. music, when it comes to, of course, data, when it comes to just pictures, video, motion, yeah. Um, so there's a lot that can be done, but to your point, generative art, really there's the random processes of nature. And to, to be frank, the, a lot of the generative art that is being created in the last are permutations of natural process. You know, when yeah. you think of flocking or swarming, those are all going to be processes um that we see in nature um, absolutely that creates some really cool stuff yeah absolutely yeah there's a really um uh interesting phenomenon where that i've observed where i create my artwork you know i have a computer science background and some i took some basic you know chemistry and classes like that but um i'm creating these patterns that i just find visually interesting and I've, I've heard from a lot of um, engineers and scientists in different fields commenting on how they uh, believe that my work reflects some aspect of, of their field. Like I've heard this from uh, geologists and um, uh, neurologists and physicists that something about the, the patterns that end up in the work are really similar to what they observe in their field. And I think it's just, you know, I think you're just when you're working with these patterns and processes, you're bound to stumble across the same kinds of influences and factors that that really shape the whole world around us. And uh, so it's a really cool uh, aspect of the work that it does it does tie to reality. You think it's abstract, but it, it has all these connections to the world around us. Yeah, yeah. So on that, what algorithm do you have? Like a favorite equation or algorithm um i i do have some algorithms that i go back to over and over again um and i think what the key part about those algorithms is, is their flexibility um and their ability to be adapted in, in a lot of different artistic uh contexts um, so I'll say a couple of the ones that come to mind are um, uh, tr a triangle subdivision algorithm and uh, this flow fields algorithm, uh, both of which I, I wrote up uh, essays on my site about. If anybody's curious about those, learning more about those particular algorithms, I went uh, very in depth on my site. Um, but uh, basically, those are you know the triangle subdivision one is it can kind of take an arbitrary polygon and uh, slice it into all these smaller shapes. And you can play with the way, the way that it um, slices, like kind of the balance of big shapes versus small shapes, leaving gaps, uh, filling them with colors. If you fill them with colors, all the ways that the colors can be kind of organized or inherited within those shapes. Um, there's just a lot of, uh, there's a lot of options for how you do it. And it's really general because it can be applied to almost any polygon. And the flow fields um, stuff is is um, also has a, those same characteristics. Um, you can use it so many different ways. Um, I gave a lot of examples in the essay on my site. Um, 
but it's just a way to create uh, really interesting kind of organic curves and uh, uh, great curves are like a an awesome building block for lots of different artwork, right? Like almost anywhere that I want some curves, um, this is a great way to create them. And um, so I'd say, yeah, the algorithms that um, uh, I like are the ones that just have that combination of flexibility and uh, uh, variety to them. Yeah, yeah, I think that yeah, curves are just a beautiful thing. And um, I've also enjoyed a lot of typography. And, you know, that's one of the most important things about like a regal or an elegant font um, yeah. is that curve. And being able to either mutate or just mangle it is also just a beautiful thing because you're taking yeah. something beautiful and straight and kind of messing it all up and then coming right. up with something new based off of that which is really yeah. cool yeah um, absolutely yeah i mean it's 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 an opportunity for either order or chaos right like yeah you can sh it shifts really smoothly between the two um which um is fantastic yeah yeah um so what are your thoughts about like crypto art generative art is definitely something that's created with the computer you can have yeah. it of course in a physical medium which you do a lot, um, but then there are other artists or other generative artists that are generating essentially just GIFs. Um, sure. What is your thoughts about that? Maybe it'd be useful if you uh, talk a little bit more about what crypto art is in, in, in the sense of like, are you purely just talking about kind of the market aspect of it, right? Like you sell a cryptographically signed piece of artwork stating that it's authenticity, is that yeah, that's that's kind of what's going for. I, I guess what I'm trying to go for is, you know, the FTEs, which are the fundable tokens. Um, yeah. Basically, uh, a certificate of authenticity on right. the blockchain to be able to say, here is a piece of artwork that belongs to you, and you can share some of that or own some of right. that. So, right. so there's the authenticity aspect and then there's the other as uh the aspect of like actually selling across sure. the internet and bringing value with your um your piece of artwork sure sure yeah i mean um i have kind of mixed feelings about it um so for my own work i prefer the final work to be a in the physical format, um, uh, you know, and, and if possible, I especially like to, to sort of create the artwork in the physical format originally, rather than creating a digital artwork and printing it. I do do a lot of creating a digital artwork and printing it, um, uh, but there's something about um, uh, a physical object that maybe this is like, who knows what part of this brain, my, of my brain this comes from, but, uh, uh, I like the aspect of having the physical object. Um, it's just kind of, it feels special to me. Um, and, and other artists uh, prefer, I've, I've heard from some other great artists that I really admire that they prefer their work to only exist in the digital format. And I think that's totally fine. Like, um, I think it's really cool uh, that artists have the option of working that way. I think it's really cool that if they, ha if they want to work that way, that they, they still have an avenue for monetizing their work. Um, and and I, I hope that uh, those artists uh, develop, a, you know, an audience of following supporters that um, uh, that also buy into that mindset and uh, support their, their purely digital work. Um, the, the, the one artist that comes to mind is um, uh, Robbie Barrett. Uh, uh, who's great, and um, I've, I've heard that he prefers things that way. Um, so, um, yeah, I think that's really cool, and I think it's great that it provides that opportunity. For me personally, um, like, I, some part of my brain doesn't jive with that. Like, I'm probably not going to buy just a digital piece of work from somebody else, and, and for the same reason, I'm probably not going to try and sell somebody just a digital work. Um, that's kind of the main, the main um, 
aspect of it. You know, everything else about it is the technology makes it a little bit easier, but nothing else really fundamentally changes uh, yeah. in my mind about about it. That's that's the key thing is kind of can you sell a digital work or not? Yeah. Do you think it will have um, any sort of, I guess, advertisement value in the future? In the sense of, um, well, if you have a couple pieces out there as a, an artist who is known by or has an audience, uh, and being able to own part of that artwork, say, yeah. you know, to Ethereum, um, right? Does that actually give you more coverage? You know, kind of like currently social media is the way that we're uh, promoting artwork, right? Um, or at least one of the avenues, but sure. could crypto or could that entire world of N NFTs and yeah. NTEs, <laughs> <I'm> fungible <laughs> NFEs <Yes. laughs> um, to the world? Uh, you know, it, it could, um, if I'm going to be honest, it's not, a, it's not an area that I think about that much. And, uh, I'm probably not going to have anything more interesting thing, anything more interesting to say about it than you. Um, <laughs> uh, I spend a lot of time thinking about our work. I do spend a lot of time thinking about, you know, about marketing, social media, all that kind of stuff. Crypto art, for the most part, um, yeah, I don't have strong feelings. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm interested. Yeah, no, uh -huh. um, it's one of those questions that I have, and I've pr personally not spent a whole lot of time because yeah. it seems to be there's a lot of hype right now and right. generally speaking when there's a whole lot of hype about something <laughs> i kind of wait till it kind of dies down either yeah, I'm you like a the super hype, early the hype early play out, right like yeah. either i'm like a super hyper or super early like adopter yeah or i'm gonna like just let the technology become either mature or just kind of fade out <laughs> right yeah i guess the one thing that i would hope that it doesn't turn into is like a sort of art stock market right like everybody buys a piece of the latest jeff coons sculpture and he gets even more rich right. <laughs> and like okay it, that's probably what will happen that's like you know yeah if that's gonna make people money then that's probably what will happen <laughs> so at least there would be a part of the market that'll go that way would be my guess yeah um, i think and so. especially yeah. if you know our work is not your sole in sole income and you love to make money <laughs> i'd yes. imagine that you go that direction yes um, <laughs> but who knows right i mean we'll see we'll see <laughs> so we were talking a little bit about social media or kind of brought that up um, yeah what 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 do you use social media currently for how do you like get a little bit more um exposure out there sure um yeah social media is um it's really a double-edged sword um you know i wrote about this also recently and it's something i, th I think about a lot um so the really pro positive part of social media is that um it's an avenue for you to get your artwork out there and for people to to see it directly right like you don't have yeah. to rely on uh galleries or or some other intermediary um in order to have people enjoy your your artwork and i think that's like a really um positive aspect of it uh i think it's a really democratizing uh, force in artwork um the the really big downside i think is uh for the artist in terms of um how it can influence the artist and the mental effect it can have on the artist, right? So like um, these social media apps, uh, they tend to boil everything down to, to, to one number, right? Like you get this count of likes on your piece of artwork. And uh, uh, you know, if you're an artist and, and especially if, if you're dealing with work that you've just created, you have a really fragile relationship with that work. Right, like you're always when you're creating new work, you're I think you're always asking yourself, is this is this good work? Is this bad work? Is this do I really like this work? Is this really the direction I want to go? 
Um, and uh, so say you take this new piece of work and you throw it up on social media and it gets, um, I don't know, let's say it gets like half of the number of likes that you normally get, right? Like that can really uh, negatively influence your opinion of your own work. And maybe uh, that work was just the baby step in a new direction that could turn out to be really uh, fantastic. And, and so sometimes social media, just that really immediate feedback that it gives, um, really simplistic feedback that it gives, uh, can, can have a really damaging effect, I think, on, on how the artist thinks about their own work. Um, and uh, I think it goes beyond that. I think it's, you know, it's really shallow feedback, right? Like it's not, if you have a conversation with somebody about the work, even if they don't like it, like that's a lot more rich experience, whereas social media is like, it's just a count of people that pushed a button. And um, uh, it's so easy to take that seriously. And it's so easy to like, you know, the number 100 is bigger than the number 50. Therefore, I'm going to do whatever got the 100, not that what got the 50, right? Like, right. it's so easy to fall into that trap. And so I've been trying really hard to, to distance myself um, that way from social media. Um, but, you know, pragmatically, realistically, if you want to get your work out there, if you want people to see it, if you want to sell it, um, that's what you have to do too, at least. There's some other avenues, but that's really the primary one. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's a tricky situation, I think, for artists. Yeah. yeah, I think the other piece is it can create a bit of an echo chamber, you know, mm -hmm. because especially if you draw like inspiration um, from your feed, you might have a couple thousand people that you follow, and you get like a nice diverse. Um, you know, feed of inspiration. However, right. at the same time, you know, the algorithms are all about engagement and trying right. to figure out what is going to make you click it or continue to scroll. So yeah. do you think yeah. that it has maybe, or I think it really has this, this ability, if you take social media, like really ser seriously, yeah. um, that it can actually influence your artwork or your, I guess, creative process um, yeah. in a negative sense. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you're right. Like, um, I think uh, we've all experienced this. You, Even if you follow 2,000 people, right, you're going to see about 30 of them, like, every time you open Instagram, right? Like, yeah. um, and uh, while there's certainly something to be said about drawing inspiration from a variety of sources and, and different artists. Um, uh, yeah, being like totally locked in, lockstep with exactly what's happening with this other small set of uh, artists maybe is not the best thing for d diversity. So yeah, uh, it'll be really interesting to see maybe long-term from a distance how this ends up affecting the trajectory of, uh, of contemporary artwork. Yeah. So on the note of like creativity, um, do you believe that creative or creativity is really just an inspiration or is there a muscle that can be um, work to get more creative? Like, especially right now, I think January is kind of happening right now right. where people right, right. are producing on a certain prompt every day, a piece. Yeah. And yeah. Some of us have full-time jobs, so you only do, you know, 30 to 45 minutes. And so right. you can either sometimes just get very generic because you don't have enough time to really experiment and play around with it. Right. Um, do you think that it is helpful or benefit to do those prompts and actually work that muscle? Does it yeah. help? Or do you think that yeah. inspiration is truly kind of random yeah yeah uh, that's a that's a great question uh, I'm really happy you asked that um, look I think I think inspiration comes from doing the work um, my observation has been that the best inspiration always comes whenever I'm already sitting down at my desk I've already started sketching I've already gone through some bad ideas and then I have uh, a good idea. Or maybe the only time when that's not the case is like, I've been working on artwork all day, 
and then later I go to bed and I think of something cool, right? But like, it's almost never the case that I'm uh, just doing something random and I haven't been working on artwork lately and ta-da, like there's a great idea. Like it just, it just doesn't happen that way. Um, yeah, inspiration comes from doing uh, the work. Uh, you gotta be really actively thinking about the work and um, trying to, to focus on it, considering all of the possibilities. Um, and uh, sometimes those ideas take a little while to meld in your brain, right? But um, uh, it's always about putting the hours in, I think. And um, I'll, I'll say, you know, you mentioned January and like using those those prompts. I think what whatever the topic is, whatever the idea is that gets you to make the work, to, to sit down and do the work is, is what you should pursue. Uh, like that's what I've had. That's what I've accepted for my own work. There's been um, there's been lots of times when I've thought like, uh, oh, I really want to like make a you know huge piece of artwork that's like uh, on this whole new level and try all these new techniques and like I'll try and, and and force myself that direction. And if that's not what where the work is kind of naturally coming out, then it's just not going to succeed. And I've had to accept over the that I really just have to do, create whatever it is that uh, is motiv motivating me to to create it. Um, and if something like January, if th those prompts really motivate you and give you a clear starting point to create artwork, then I think that's fantastic. Um, uh, if that's a turnoff for you, then like don't worry about it at all, right? Like do your own thing. Um, uh, I think it's it's all about learning how to follow your your internal motivations and um, uh, and then just sitting down at your desk and uh, creating work. That's really, I'm, so, I'm a broken record at this point, but that's really the key to it. <laughs> no, it's, you know, it's, I think it's one of those maturity pieces, you know, early on when you're younger, I guess, you know, teenager, for example, you're going to think that, you know, being an artist or the best artist you know is due to either like an inspiration that comes right. out of nowhere you know a eureka moment right um, and i think you know as you grow you realize you know whatever art you're doing you know even if it's just for personal like pleasure um yeah. you feel like or you realize that that curve um really comes out of like just doing it because yeah new ideas that you try generate more ideas and yes. it seems to be like an inspiration in its own exactly yeah even if those ideas fail like you learn from them and it's not like every good idea all my eureka ideas what i feel like are eureka ideas uh are like in retrospect just like really small variations from something that I already did or like two ideas that I already tried and combined them, right? It's not something that came out of the blue. It's like, hey, I've worked really hard on this one idea and I've worked really hard on this other idea. Ooh, like here's a way, here's a thread that connects them. Let me explore that, right? Like um, it's never, it's like, you know, bolt of lightning that strikes out of nowhere, right? <laughs> <laughs> guess it's one of those things if it does happen to somebody you're like good luck <laughs> yeah well, yeah i mean like uh you have to know how to pull it off too right like that's the other part about our work is like you can have the good idea and then executing it's the whole other half of it and if you don't know how to execute it and that's for sure a muscle uh it doesn't matter what good ideas you have so yeah so what muscle do you have to train when it comes to generative art. So as a newcomer or somebody that has never done gener generative art, um, where would I start? Yeah. Um, I think the main muscle is learning how to explore through code. Um, even for me, and I've been making generative work for, I'm gonna say six years now, 
not sure if that's exactly right, but that's about right. Um, uh, every work is a process of, of exploration. Um, I'm always starting out with some really basic idea and um, I just, I got I to gotta put something on the screen, right? Like I can't have that blank canvas um, staring back at me. I got to put something on the screen and then I got to play with it and see where it can go. And um, so I think that muscle is, uh, yeah, learning how to play with the algorithms, right? So you can, you start to think about like, oh, what if instead of doing this, you know, 10 times, what if I did this a thousand times? Or what if I made it a uh, hundred times bigger or a hundred times smaller, or I did it with lines instead of shapes? Um, or, you know, uh, I could play with organizing the colors this way or this way or this way. Um, so it's, it's learning to consider all of those possibilities for how to play with the program. Um, uh, and, and kind of building your toolkit. And, and the other muscle is uh, really just the same as any artist uh, has to develop. It's the muscle of learning how to sit down at your desk, how to focus for a little while, and how to finish a work. Um, I, think, I think if you have those, then you'll end up making something good. Yeah. Yeah. And there's so many resources when it comes to the actual, like, technical tools, the brushes, so to say, uh, yeah. processing being that what you're using or what I use in my work as well. Um, right. And then there's, you know, one, there are dozens of other <laughs> frameworks to be able to use that one with. Yeah. And I think, uh, I'm glad you mentioned that. I think that, um, I feel like the engineering programming part of the challenge is like, it's actually really easy compared to the artistic challenge of it. And to be fair, I do say that as like a seasoned programmer, like if you're starting out programming, that's probably not the case. Uh, but uh, if you at least have a decent handle on programming, like none of the generative art stuff has to be super complicated. Some people do take it to like a very mathematical level. Um, I don't personally do that. I don't have any interest in that. Um, a lot of my programs, you know, I feel like, uh, I don't know, a senior in college could write uh, just fine. Uh, and uh, uh, so, yeah, I mean, I think the muscle doesn't have to be being the extreme Uber programmer, right? I think the artistic stuff is way more uh, a difficult challenge because it's so elusive, right? Like, right. once you learn how to do a for loop, like, it's gonna be the same forever, right? But like art, yep. every every piece of artwork you make is a new challenge, and that and it gets harder every time. I think. Yeah. Um, and, you ask uh, the questions: Should I randomize the step that the for loop is taking, or should I like be uniform? Or <laughs> right, right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. You start thinking about all of those possibilities, and that's that's the interesting and challenging part. I think. Yeah. Yeah. So you were talking about just the hard piece of work. What do you think about kind of the the GANs or the general or adversarial networks that have come out yeah. in the last like five years? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I'll say that um, I've watched it with a lot of uh, interest. Um, uh, I've really enjoyed, especially the work of um, uh, Mario Klingeman and um, Robbie Barrett, like I mentioned. Um, I think, uh, I mean, I think it's a really powerful tool. I'm, I'm, I'm really glad that people are using it, uh, artistically. Um, uh, it's not at all related to my, <laughs> to my toolkit. Like, uh, I don't personally use them at all, but, um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's generative artwork at kind of like a, almost a meta level. And, uh, I will say it is more dependent on the input, right? Like it's um, the art, the artistry in GAN artwork comes from the selection of the data set and how you train the algorithm. And um, there's really a lot of space for uh, artistic invention in both in both areas there. Um, and I think I think it's really cool. Um, 
and I think we'll, we'll keep seeing it uh, uh, evolve. So I'm stoked that it, it's out there. Um, yeah. I think it's very interesting. I mean, eventually we'll have a Tyler net <laughs> GAN <laughs> yeah. where we just right. throw all of your uh, images in and kind of see what right. comes out of it. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, like, uh, uh, I, we've seen that with, like, you know, Fanco or – I'm trying to think of who else they've done that. Van Gogh's always everybody's go-to, but um, uh, you know, whatever Matisse net, and uh, so I mean, I do think that um, training it on a generative art set uh, has a lot of potential, mostly because it's uh, there's so many images, um, it creates a good training set. And actually, um, um, some artists have already done that. Um, uh, Helena Saren and uh, Dmitry Cherniak. Uh, uh, Helena does um, the GAN portion of it, and, and Dmitry is kind of a, a generative artist in the same vein of, of work that I create. And uh, she trained a GAN on the output of his work, and I thought I thought that was really cool. Yeah. Uh, so there's some there's some room for overlap. Um, yeah. For oh, sure. I'm excited. I think for two reasons with games. I think one is to kind of remix quote unquote um somebody's artwork but yeah. then it's also like kind of a like precursor to a final product uh product as well because you throw in you know in whatever data set that you want and you get a variation which could also draw or create some inspiration um from which yeah. you can then go further with as well so yeah it's it's definitely an interesting tool to use um, as a, um, yeah, platform to, to continue to generate. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. One thing that I had heard recently was a discussion about the generative, um, uh, or adversarial networks, the GANs. Yeah. Um, wondering if it's more interpolation versus this actual generation. So what that means is, you know, you have all of these images that you're throwing into a neural network. Right. And so it's all the same information and they're going to be a mixture of everything. So is it more yeah. like an interpolation or is it yeah. really a generation? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, um, it's a little bit uh, somewhere in between, right? So like the main breakthrough of GANs in the first place is that um, they work through stacked neural networks, right? And kind of at each level of the neural network, it's extracting higher and higher level features. And so maybe at the base, um, it's low level features about, you know, the fine details of how some pixels might be organized. And all the way at the top, it's maybe like uh, features like, I don't know, you know, big curves should look like this, or the color red and blue should be have this kind of relationship, right? So, like, um, it is kind of interpolating uh, these these works of art. Like, it's not it's not creating something outside of the space of what it was trained on, but it is at least capable of uh, mutating some of these at least medium level ideas about what the image can contain and um, and often mutating it in ways that like we as humans would never think to do, right? I think that's the yeah. really interesting part is yeah. uh, 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 obviously we have a lot of visual artists who've messed with images in a lot of ways and it's all, and the way that GANs mess with it is different from everything we've ever, ever come up with before. Yeah. Um, so computers have a different ideas about uh, what, 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 it's normal what fits right um so i think that's that's the really cool part about it to me is like it's uh seeing this relation of of the features through through a different mindset and um yeah yeah no um i'm excited as well i'm very interested to kind of what comes of it or doesn't come of it <laughs> um, yeah all I know is that it's a, it's a new uh, process that can be used by pretty much any artist. Um, right. And 
and you really can come up with some very interesting things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's the same as like, uh, I don't know, like painting, right? Like anybody can technically make a painting. You just go buy some paints and a brush and some paper or canvas, and you can make a painting. But, but uh, the real artistic decisions, like I said, is is that vision for how you curate the data set, how you train it, what you're getting the program to optimize for. So do you think we are going to see generative art get into the mainstream, the mainstream of the art world? I mean, I, uh, I have to imagine it will sooner or later, like it would just be, it would just be dumb if it didn't. <laughs> it would, uh, so it's, so it's, you know, the listeners, viewers here, like a little history lesson. Generative art has been around since since the 60s. Um, it was first, you know, around uh, the first time that computers really uh, started to become established. Um, artists started creating artwork through through programming. And uh, there were some early shows and uh, really they experienced strong rejection from the classical art world. Um, uh, I would, I'll say critics were almost repulsed at the idea of involving computers in artwork. They viewed it as like anti-artistic, right? Like somehow it took the human element out of it. Um, I think I think in hindsight, uh, that view is entirely wrong um, because first of all, computers are just another tool. They're, they happen to be an incredibly powerful tool, but they're just another tool that we can use to create our artwork. And and second of all, at this point, you know, computers play such a huge role in our lives that um, we have to have artwork that talks about computers and deals with computers as well. Um, it, it, it just doesn't make sense not for them to play a big role in our artwork too. Um, and uh, so what I like about generative art, one of the things that really motivates me to create it is that it does have so much to say about computers, about our relationship to computers, about the differences between the human aesthetic and the computer aesthetic and uh, or the relation between them. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I think it's really relevant. And I think it will only be more relevant. I don't think anybody's predicting that computers are going to play less of a role in our lives, right? It's really the opposite of that. Um, so, uh, work that deals more fundamentally with programming with computers is going to become more and more important. Um, and um, I think sooner or later the classical art world will catch up to that. Uh, I don't know what the tipping point will be. I do feel like uh, there's more of a popular base for generative artwork right now. I feel like the latest generation of generative artwork is a lot better than what came before. Um, and uh, and I do think there were a lot of flaws with earlier generative artwork. I think I, I think it, you know, some of the critiques were it, it was cold and heartless in some sense, right? And I think there's some merit to that. Um, a lot of these were just engineers with no artistic backgrounds um, and they weren't able to properly communicate a lot of the ideas that they had and a visual uh, format. And so I think we're, we're seeing more artists that have a programming background, more programmers that have an art, artistic background. And so I think the quality of work that's coming out now is better and, and that'll play a role. Um, and, and yeah, sooner or later it'll be well accepted. And I think it'll, I think rather than just being a, a little genre on its own, I think it'll be part of the tool set of how art gets made in general. Um, it doesn't, you know, like the generative medium is an, it's an approach, not a genre, right? Like it happens to be both a, a genre and an approach right now, but it doesn't need to be just a genre. Uh, I think uh, I think that approach can be sort of applied to a very wide stylistic variety of artwork. Yeah, yeah. Now, uh, I mean, at, at some point we'll see them kind of converge where that's at least what I'm guessing is where, you know, the medium is not necessarily going to be understood. <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, as technology gets better, we'll have things that or technologies or inventions such as, you know, 
painting and texture and being able to replicate a specific texture and not just yeah. through like 3d printing but you know a pure canvas that yeah. might have been entirely generated by a computer program however right. its output is not going to be understood right yeah yeah i, I think it'll uh I think everything will get really blurred together, and, uh, and and yeah, I think it'll get really much more accessible to non-programmers, uh, and uh, so yeah, it'll be really interesting to see how it integrates with the more traditional art world over time. Yeah, yeah. So we'll pretty much kind of wrap up, but I think one last question I have is what. Um, three books or articles have impacted your life or work that you would recommend to read? Yeah. Um, I think, um, honestly, the, the ones that have made the biggest difference for me as an artist have been applicable to any artist. They're not necessarily specific to generative work. Um, I'll say uh, the first ones that come to mind are um uh art and fear it's a book that was written i think back in the 70s and it's kind of general advice for artists but um uh, uh it absolutely applies to you know to a medium like generative artwork um it's it's really just about uh where you find the motivation to create artwork how you deal with people's responses to it um how you think about your own work how you decide to take the plunge and, and, and go exploring and try and find new ideas for your own work, things like that. Um, so yeah, Art and Fear, uh, really, really fantastic book. I think I've probably read it about five times now at this point. Um, uh, along a similar vein is uh, The War of Art, uh, which is um, very, uh, it's a book that doesn't contain a lot of words, but he, each page has such uh, powerful ideas in it that um, you have to like stop and think uh, about how to apply it every time. And and it's you know I talked earlier a lot about uh, you know inspiration comes from sitting down and doing the work, and uh, and that's like the most crucial part is just sitting down and doing the work, right? Like uh, the War of Art really hammers that message home. Um, it's about uh, getting your uh, your process together, about getting your routine together, about kind of being professional about the way that you do things, um, and uh, it's 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 really uh, motivational. It's fantastic. I really like it. Um, for a third one, you know, there there's not as clear of a third one for me. Um, I think it's really. I learn uh, pieces from everything. Um, I try a lot to uh, read a, a diverse set of uh, viewpoints on, on artwork. Um, I try to read uh, classical literature. I try to read really new contemporary literature. Um, I try to read about uh, artwork that I don't necessarily like, um, especially if I don't feel like I fully understand it. Um, uh, I try to read um, the thoughts of, of uh, not just critics, right? Like a lot of art books are written by critics. I try to also read the stuff that's written by artists themselves because if you're an artist, sometimes that viewpoint is resonates a lot more strongly than the critic's viewpoint, right? Like the critic can think about things in this very heady intellectual way. And sometimes the artist is like, I just really like the color blue and any any painting I can make with the color blue is great. So I make blue paintings, right? Like, yeah, yeah. it's great to hear from an artist that, that like that's uh, a valid way to think about your own work. And so um, I would say, you know, try to have an open mind, try to read things that challenge your or preconceptions a little bit about yeah. artwork. Yeah, well, thank you so much, Tyler, for taking the time. Um, and absolutely just talking great. through, and it's been a great conversation. Yeah, absolutely. And 
Yeah, thank you. I hope we can hear of you more and we're excited to see some more of your work in the future. Thank you so much. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Fantastic conversation. Thank you. All right, stopped. Cool.